I want to welcome everyone to the Parrot Club's June 2023 program. We're talking tonight with parrot behavior consultant and professional bird trainer Debbie Goodrich on how to get your parrot back when it escapes. Debbie began her professional work with parrots with Rainforest Cafe, where she rose to a curatorial position. She is the professional member of IAATE, the International Avian Animal Trainers and Educators, IMATA, International Marine Animal Trainers Association, and a lifetime member of ABMA, Animal Behavior Management Alliance. She has lectured around the U.S. about parrot care and humane practices, as well as having performed with her amazing parrot ambassadors at over 2,000 educational programs. She helped create Flight Club Foundation 2013 dedicated to helping parrots and people globally, and she regularly contributes to conferences and scientific articles. And this fall, uh, they will again be having the Seattle Parrot Expo, which is both in person and online. Obviously, there's more stuff in person, but if you don't live in the Northwest, it's probably easier to go online for it. And I can tell you, it's an absolutely fabulous conference every year. They have great speakers and I've been attending virtually for the last few years. So uh, I hope everybody gets a chance to check it out. And with that, I will turn it over to Debbie. Hi, everybody. What a great introduction. I really appreciate that. That's amazing. Um, also, I encourage everybody to fly out, get your plane tickets to fly out, um, because coming here in September is usually extremely stunning um, in the Northwest. So if you guys can do it, I would, because we're going to actually give you lunch in addition to. So everything that you see online, we give you even more when you come to live. So imagine having like a nice Hawaiian barbecue on us and coffee barista and all kinds of fun things. Plus, besides you get to see our aviary parrots of the world, which has over 50 birds that will be on display. So it's gonna be cool. And we hope you guys come, uh, we'd love to see you. So that's Seattle Parrot Expo, but we're here to talk about parrots flying off, which is one of the specialties that Flight Club Foundation has kind of come to specialize in uh, over time. It's become our main uh, thing that we are really decent at. We've been, I've actually learned most of my recovery techniques from, uh, of all people, Chris Biro. Uh, when he first opened the chats way long time ago, back in 1999, on Yahoo groups about possibly free flying parrots. So um, his direct experience and different types of scenarios where birds were kind of in not the greatest of straits and getting them out of those situations is what I learned. And I learned that on a practical hands-on way uh, through him and then of course various training and uh, conferences, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of where uh, my experience comes from. And then of course my own birds that I've been training for outdoor flying and the experiences uh, with them. And then of course that of clients that we've worked with over the years. So that's what's gonna be in this lovely presentation we're having here today. I'm gonna share the presentation and see if it will work for me. You guys see at least a small thing there with all those screen things. And if I'm gonna do like that, can you guys all see all that? Okay, I see a thumbs up by Amy there. All right, so uh, thank you so much for having me come out today, and I do appreciate this. Uh, Flight Club Foundation is a nonprofit organization that helps parrots and people around the world, and we really enjoy being able to bring this stuff out to you. So the biggest thing whenever a bird flies off for the very first time is you need to know what is the natural history of this animal that's flown off. Like, what does it normally do when it's out there in the wild? So from my degree in psychobiology from the University of California at Santa Cruz, uh, the one thing really nice about it is that um, one of the things that a lot of trainers are learning now are all the different sciences that are involved in um, animal behavior. So one of the things we've learned, a lot of us have taken even the course, which is the Living and Learning with Animals, LLA, that's presented with um, uh, <laughs> Dr. Susan Friedman, of course. And uh, that's a really great class in learning applied behavioral analysis. But I also come from the ethology too. So that's one thing that my degree also did was looking at like, how do I look at what are these species trends? That's what ethology kind of studies. And so how can I analyze these species trends in a scientific way by taking data and looking at these trends and what these animals tend to do? 
I also got to look at it from the comparative anatomy physiology perspective as well in my uh, degree. So I took a lot of comparative anatomy physiology classes. As a matter of fact, in my um, sensory perception class that I took, which was amazing, um, I, we were studying the eye and vision in various animals, and I happened to bring in my parrot, and they absolutely went nuts. And the whole entire lecture of my professor turned from looking more at mammals vision, looking into actual bird vision, and he just went crazy. And so I know a lot of cool things about bird vision, which is another way that you can help get Barrett's bag is how they see things. Um, so it was really, really neat graduating from there because I did get the exposure to ABA. I did get exposure to um, psychological phenomena. I did get exposure to comparative anatomy, physiology, exposure to ethology, soci uh, sociology, and all that stuff. So it all makes a difference. That's why now some of these trainers who've only learned positive reinforcement training are finally going, Oh, there's like this whole entire like nonlinear contingency stuff that Barbara Heidenreich's been talking about. I'm like, yes, all these different sciences are needed for us to help get these birds back, to help us learn what the birds need in the future and uh, things like that. So um, I'm really excited about that. And I do see that there's a mention on chat, but I can't get to it because my mouse isn't working uh, when I'm doing share screen. So is there somebody who has a question? Uh, no, it's not a question, just so. Okay, just make it sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, so in this case, to know the, what you gotta look at is flight patterns. And that's kind of, so now you guys know where I'm looking at a situation where I, how I'm looking at it. So I'm looking at it from all the different scientific lenses to try to get these guys back. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is what is the species that's out? Is it a cockatiel that's out? A cockatoo that's out? A macaw that's out? An Indian ringneck that's out? And each one of them are gonna have different types of um, behavior in their flight skill, regardless of what they've actually learned in the here and now, uh, that are trends in their species specific behavior that we see in mythology that we can then apply to the individual. So in this case, as a general whole, we're looking really big picture here. So I'm gonna step way out. I'm gonna look at parrots as a general whole, the whole entire order, 387 species we know of right now. So most parrots are ranging animals. They're not migratory animals. There's only one migratory species we know of, and that is the, um, uh, oh gosh, the swift, not the swift parrot. Yeah, the swift parrot. I think it's the swift parrot, yeah. It's in Australia and Australasia. Asia. It basically, its migration is from Tanzania to Australia and back. So it's a really, really short migration. And that's the only migratory parrot that we know of. And it's critically, critically endangered because of sugar gliders. Wow, crazy, right? Um, so most parrots instead are ranging animals. They stay within 25, maybe 50 miles maximum from their like normal house roosting sites that we know of to where they kind of mill out to where their um, breeding sites are. So they have, a, typically most of them have a short flight time and distance, no more than like in a single, a single flat out flight. Um, they might do as much as seven to eight miles, but usually not more than that in a singular flight. That doesn't mean that's how much they fly a day. Usually what we see in telemetry studies from Tampa Potter Research Center, we're seeing that they fly about 20 to 30 miles a day. That's where that number comes from. Most of my knowledge I'm going to share with you today, I'm going to use more on the macaw side of typical behavior um, and, and, and analysis, just so you guys know. Um, and obviously, like, say, your, your ring necks and your cockatiels and things, those guys and parakeets, when they get out, they act react differently. But this is what we have a lot of information on in the wild, is how macaws are doing in the wild. We have a lot of telemetry studies of them. Um, we do for uh, Costa Rican parrot, uh, Costa Rican, Puerto Rican parrots too. Um, they have some good telemetry studies with them to know how far they go. And they're also about the same as the macaws. They don't go very far as far. So this, don't forget that 20 miles is in a range, like a circular range, not 20 miles straight shot out, if that makes any sense. Um, so they also are diurnal species. So they like to stay active during the day and then they be quiet at night because those predators, owls who will not give up on you once they target you at night is not a good plan to make any kind of noise with. That's why these guys are very quiet. 
when it comes to an owl attacking you in the middle of the night is, I don't know if you guys have heard, but if you ever hear an owl flap its wings, their wings are very silent. So you have to be really careful about um, being making noise yourself since owls aren't making noise and they're listening for you. That's why these guys are really, really typically quiet at night. Um, they do uh, respond well to any kind of flock member. So you yourself are usually some form of flock member, or if you have, I can see that uh, we have multiple cockatiels going on there. And um, so having multiple friends or flock members in the family, they will definitely respond to that or any kind of familiar sound. And then last but least, as a general trend of all parrots, nothing different uh, across the board is that they are prey species and typically have neophobia, which is the fear of new things. Um, which is why it's really recommended to use climbing as a last resort versus a first resort when it comes to recovering parrots. Because of that, like, whoa, that's a ladder, I'm out. Um, or, hey, that's a cherry picker, I'm out. Um, or that's a strange fire guy that has all this equipment, I'm out. So we've seen that happen quite a lot. So the first question I have is, is a parrot's proclivity, like their main thing that they wanna do in their day, is it all focused solely on flying? Do they have to fly, 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 fly? Do they fly a lot? Do they fly long distances? Do they fly all the time? And the answer is they don't. <laughs> the more convenience um, these guys have, there's this thing called energetic cost. Um, and every animal has a certain amount of cost to benefit. It's a cost benefit ratio. And these are the scarlet macaws that were released in Tambopata. And so these guys had learned some nice lovely traits of like, hey, if you stick around humans, they feed you or I can steal food from them either way. And so they've learned that this convenience factor and as a result of getting this convenience and high caloric food, they don't have to go searching for it everywhere. It's all right there at the lodge. So this is Chichui specifically. She is a very famous scarlet macaw that um, was a part of these, the Chico program of this release in 1994. Um, and she and about 20 other scarlet macaws kept coming back to the lodge after being released. Um, and that's because they had imprinted on humans and that they found that that's a problem for reintroduction projects is that if you raise these guys as babies and release them, they don't have a fear of humans anymore. And they don't quite act like a wild parrot should, which is being fearful of humans and staying away. So blue and golds in the same area, they were also raised at Tambopata at the same time, interestingly did not do this behavior. They fully went out to the wild. As a matter of fact, they went out to the wild so much, they don't even know if those birds were successfully released or not. They had no data because they disappeared. Wing! So, um, so they don't know how they did, um, in fact. So, but if you can tell here, a lot of times parrots choose to climb over flying. And that's obvious to me because of that physiology that parrots have versus say a eagle. Um, those guys have a wholly different type of physiology. They can soar for long periods of time. If you watch parrots, they can't soar for very long. Eventually, they have to really start using those wings again because their face is so heavy. They have this strong, heavy face that's designed to hang their body weight from their face. Um, no other bird can hang their body weight from their beak alone except a parrot. So there's a lot of musculature and stuff that added weight in that face as a result. So their flying strategy is different. They go for the climbing strategy if they can. And so a lot of them do choose to climb, like in Scarlet Macaw. So when I'm called out to say, okay, so I'm coming into this whole idea from this background of like evolution, ethology, and biology background, and now I'm coming into the individual. So now I'm starting to look at like what's going on with the situation. So the picture here is Storm, a hyacinth macaw, um, owned by a gentleman by the name of Tom, who was in a wheelchair. He's actually wheelchair bound. And this guy got out and was having fun in a tree. This tree is not very high. And um, it's only about maybe 30 feet. And that Storm looking down at me, um, standing on the ground. Um, and basically at the basically about as far as distant as Tom was. So the question I had for Tom for this guy was, you know, have you flight trained this parrot? Is he not just flying around the house, but did you purposely have him fly from A to B? He knows recall training. Um, how often did you do the recall training in the house? How many times did your parrots have an opportunity to go outside, like where they walked around outside in hand? 
Were they only in carriers? Were they allowed to fly around outside? Some people do allow that, other people don't. Like Chris Armstrong was mentioned, yeah, obviously. He flies his birds outside all the time. So um, you're not gonna have as many of these like random fly offs I'm gonna be focusing on today. Um, do you have um, a heavier practice we call training in other locations besides the house? Um, and do you have a cue that your bird responds well to when you call? Like if I go, oh my like that, Ollie goes, you know, so she's really, really good at recalling to that sound as, like, as far as letting me know where she is. Is this um, what your bird's going to respond to when it sees this? It knows, come to it. And then how easily, how readily does it do it? Um, or is this it? Or is it just come here, the word? Or is it how I'm looking at the bird? So those things you need to know how rapidly the bird will respond to those kinds of sounds. Um, and then how fast is the response? If I go like this, is it 20 minutes later, it's finally landing on me? Or is it I go like this and five minutes later it's landing on me? Um, or is it this and they immediately fly and land on me? Um, and then did you work on or train uh, contact calls? So when you have a bird that flies off, even this guy, this highest symbol call, have you guys noticed he's already kind of blending with the environment? He kind of is, right? I mean, he's there, kind of obvious, but also kind of blending. So when you're out there in the field trying to find these guys, you usually can't see them, even though they're right there, big, bright red maha, and they're right there, you can't see them. And so the only way you know that they're really there is that you hear them. And so that's why when people do go out to start looking for these guys, I really recommend, you know, you call out, you know, for the bird to come, but then you're very, very, very silent and you're listening to any small sound. You're listening for crows kind of making some weird sounds. You're listening to other songbirds making weird sounds. Like, oh, that's not right. There's something kind of weird over here. Let me go investigate. Sure enough, there's a parrot there. So um, it's really important to look at those things as well. Doo -doo. So this is my uh, video here. This is my green wing macaw on the top and then my blue and gold macaw, Jesse, on the bottom. Ollie has shown the interest in learning to fly, so she is flighted, whereas Jessie below her is not interested in learning to fly, so I've kept her uh, trimmed because she does not want to learn, and I've tried, and she's just not interested. So when you look at this video or you look at any bird that flies, ask yourself, does this bird hesitate when it goes to take off? Does it have to calculate and then go, or can it just immediately go? Can it stop in flight, turn, and have control of flight? Or does it have to keep going and slams into the perch when it lands? Uh, meaning it doesn't have as much control of its flight. That means its landing is too hard. Um, can it turn in flight? Can it fly downwards? Flying like that for a parrot, a downwards like this, is way too steep of an angle for almost 90% of birds. Only your really, really lightweight guys, like your parakeets, your cockatiels, um, can manage to really drop down at a significant degree. Your big macaws, they can't do it. They, I mean, it really takes a lot of training, a lot of specialty training to teach them to do that drop behavior that doesn't really even occur in the wild very often. It's kind of crazy, but true. Um, so I've watched the wild parrots in, in, um, in Tampa Pata and we saw the one that was walking around, but I saw a lot of flying, of course, too, naturally. And they hang upside down, they climb upside down, but they don't fly. They almost always fly at some kind of like more level angle and they're kind of up and down around the different things. And then they'll kind of, they can do a quick minute turn, but they still just kind of, for the most part, stay in these kinds of realms like that. And then you also are looking at their wing beats. Are they flapping like this? Or are they flapping, you know, like how like frantic are their flaps? Are they flapping pretty hard where they feel like they have to fly harder or can they fly slower? Can they hold their wing? Can they actually do some gliding? Can they glide down and angle their wings? So those are all the different things. Can it pick random landings or correct itself mid-flight? Those are the guys that have the highest training and time put into them. The guys that can go, oh, you're over here, and then come down. Like you see with Chris Armstrong spurs, if you ever watch any of his videos, they can do that. They go like you're flying along, oh, oh, let's go this way. And then they just change and yank and just change right away and they can do that kind of work. So you take a look at this girl and you tell me if she's a good flyer. Good girl, come on. Good girl, good girl. 
So what'd you guys think? Is she a good flyer? I mean, you can also nod your head if you want your videos on. You can turn your videos on. I can see if you say yes or no as well. So do you think she's a good flyer? She did stop and uh, think before she took off. She didn't just bolt. And yeah, there it is again. But she did fly good down. Though, so. Good girl. So good flyer. Good girl. Okay, so what I saw there is a flying sausage. <laughs> uh, my green wing is a flying sausage. I love her dearly, but she's a flying sausage. Um, so uh, that's all. I don't have too many birds to choose from to free fly. So I have a very, very limited supply of birds. I don't have unlimited bunny or breeding birds like Chris might have. So um, Ollie was my only candidate that showed any interest in flying. So that's what I worked on. In her case, she had waited. She tabulated, she had to like calculate. And then only when she felt confident and stared right at me and had to keep staring right at me the whole entire time she was flying for her to come to me. Whereas when I see my Nande Conyers fly, it's a whole other ball of wax. Those guys fly anywhere, everywhere, change, yank, I'll do all kinds of stuff and can manage to come to me without that hesitation. So she also had to flap her wings hard and she also had her tail brakes on full. So she wasn't even giving herself full flight speed at all. So um, so those are things you look for when these guys are flying out there. Are they putting their tail down, trying to keep their brakes on? Are they keeping their tail up? You know, so those are all different things you need to be aware of. So like these guys, you kind of hesitated because he wants to know where to land in comparison to the other bird, right? Um, and this is not a whole lot of flying going on right now, but um obviously these guys are like having a pretty good rustle and instead of going like oh i i just i don't i'm not comfortable i think i need to fly off instead of thinking they need to fly off they stick around and keep wrestling with each other and re wrestling upside down going after each other's feet these guys are a bonded pair <laughs> and that's just one of the things that macaws like to do they like to wrestle a lot and they of course climb a lot and even though they might be looking like they should want to fly off, which they can at any time, they're again opting not to, but when they do, they can just take off without even thinking. There's no thought process. I can come over here. Oh, I have to hesitate for just a second to get the other side of my buddy. Um, but for the most part, uh, these guys are really, really, really good flyers <clears throat> because they just don't even have to think. They just go. You can see it when they can just go and I'll think on the wing, I'll get there somehow. I'll figure it out, but right now I can just go and figure out how I'm going as I go along. That's somebody who's really skilled. So, um, which leads to the idea of, you know, should we clip our birds for their safety? As a curator of Rainforest Cafe, um, we were required to tell everybody for years, I almost worked there for nearly a decade, and we told everybody, you have to clip your birds' wings for their safety, period. That was it. And it's something we definitely believed in. I mean, not only that, but the birds were in a mall setting with all these people out front all the time. So for their safety, should they be flying all, all the time? Um, I myself, once I took the birds home with me, wanted to start flying them right away. So here is Ollie, my clipped pair, who was clipped for a year at Rainforest Cafe that I now want to fly outside. Oh my gosh, that is not the bird that you want to choose for a candidate for free flight training. I'll tell you that again and again. You do not want a bird that has not been a baby fledged to be flying outside. It's not a good plan. Anybody can tell you that nowadays. Um, but that's the only guy I had for my candidate to learn how to fly. And she really wanted to learn. So I taught her. But again, I don't take her outside for flights. But she has flown off outside many times. And I've gotten her back many times. So this is what we're kind of working on here to show you guys. So as far as clipping or flying to me, I look at it as what is your limiting factors that the animal's living in and try to maximize their welfare within the environment they live in. So that's the way I look at it. So I look at all the limitations of the family, all the limitations of the actual landscape, the, li the limitations within the actual house as to what I just, you know, advise like having a bird flighted or not most of my birds are flighted and i just picked up three cockatiels and they're flighted and my nandays are flighted but i have a couple that are clipped and that would be jesse and my uh african gray because i take them out to some pretty hairy situations that they're not scared of per se but i don't also because they don't want to learn how to fly 
they don't stick around per se, they might not stick around. So I want to make sure that they are, have a safer lifestyle. Obviously, no matter what, when it comes to flying, which is what we all know nowadays, is that obviously it increases their cardiovascular activity. It increases the, uh, the bone density. Does it become as much of a problem where these guys have really nice lean bones and they can work uh, really well and actually increase their bone density, uh, which can be a problem, obviously, for structure. So when they have a lot of exercise, they have a lot more cardiovascular going into the bones, growing the bones to be stronger. Um, so flying does help with that. Learning the advanced skills are all learned, guys. They're not just intrinsic. They know to flap their wings and that's about it. And then they take off and you can, when I've seen a bird that's never had any flight skills fly for the first time, you can see it on their face like, what am I doing? Their, their eyes are wide. Their mouth is kind of open. Their, their flight is erratic. Um, so you can totally tell they're like, I'm flying, but I can't stop and I can't turn. I don't know what I'm doing yet. Um, and they kind of have that look to their face. Um, so flying down is, like I said, is a very, very advanced flight skill, especially for macaws. Littler guys, like I said, your cockatiels and stuff, they can do it and they have done it um, with much more regularity than a macaw. Um, but also at the same time, when it comes to your small guys like the cockatiels and the parakeets, they're almost impossible to ground. So clipping those guys is really almost not worth it. And I actually kind of advise against it because it's just going to limit their flight. It's not going to stop their flight. And with macaws, it doesn't necessarily stop their flight. I've, we've all been told how we can get a cliff parrot still in a tree. Um, however, when it comes to them being at the top of trees, gaining speed, gaining altitude, those guys usually have at least one flight feather on each side. They are not fully clipped. So clipped to me, by definition, should be the first seven primary flight feathers along the wing covert that you cut. And that gets these guys to go from here and they slowly make their way down. That's what you should be seeing, even if they're really, really frightened, even with wind, with wind, they might like be like that and come down. So that's a clipped parrot. Anything that's not that is not a clipped parrot. It's a semi-flighted parrot. And those guys are the most dangerous birds flying out there. They can't put the brakes on the way they need to because they have only a couple of flights to gain the speed and altitude, but not enough for braking. Does that make sense? So they're really, really dangerous um, to have semi-flighted birds out there. Um, so if you're going to do clipping, do it clipping. Or if you're going to do flying, keep them flighted. Don't have them in between the two um, and have them outside. Um, and then last but not least, when it comes to fully flighted parrots that you don't train to fly, they do become this very serious needle in the hair stack, haystack problem. So they take off and we have absolutely no clue where they are. We can't find them anywhere. And we are looking forever and trying to find them. And we've done a lot of those cases, some of which have never been recovered. <clears throat> we've had a lot that we do get back though. So don't think that you can't recover them because you can, which is why I'm here. Okay, so the moment that the parrot flies off, whatever you do, don't go, ah, my parrot. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Stay as calm as you can. You know, they, oh, he's flying off. Watch as best you can where they're going. Um, do they go right from the house, beeline straight out the door and then take off and then turn to the right? Or do they turn to the left? Try to watch that if you can. And then be calm as they're lowering. Like, hey, come back. It's okay. You know, try to, try to sound like you're inside the house as if he's flying in a place that's safe. Because if you act like, like ah, um, the bird sees you as you being threatened by a predator yourself. So you're now no longer a safe place for the bird to come back to because you're acting all like scared and, or just moving quickly, which is also unpredictable. So it's both unpredictable and it looks like you could be threatened by a predator. Therefore, I should stay away from you. So that's why you got to stay so calm. Yesterday, just yesterday, I took my um, blue crown conure out. She is fully flighted. She learned to fully fly at, uh, as a fledgling. She is one of my good fledgling flyers. And um, the owner that originally had her would take her around Green Lake, just jogging every day as a conure outside, fully flighted with no consequence, right? She just, oh. It flies around, it avoids hawks all the time. I'm like, whoa. So I got this bird from her because she was a fly attack at your face and put holes in your face bird. 
And so I had to work with her on that. But I do know this, if she goes outside, she finds me and she knows how, and she will come down at any angle to come and find me, which is amazing. So yesterday I had her uh, doing like, a, we're inside a tent kind of situation, but it was still outdoors where she had access to outdoors. Usually she doesn't go off too far and she decided to go off across this entire field, but she turned around and came right back and landed on me. So it was kind of nice. So just make sure your birds are really, really, really trained for that. So she flew off, but she also didn't because she obviously came back. So that's why it's really important to take note of where it flew. So in her case, she flew off. I wasn't nervous at all. I just stayed very, very calm, watched where she went. And then she landed on a uh, soccer pole right next to me. And then I just left her there, walked over, got a little chair that let me get up a little bit higher to her. And then she came down to me. And as long as I stayed calm, she came right, right to me. No problem. But I'm sure if I was, whoa, come here, come back, she would have just kept on flying. So I'm really glad that I kept my wits about me, despite being in front of all these bands and rides, and, and she still managed to come back to me. Um, so those also keep in mind, when your bird flies off, we make sure, did it go up, right, left, down, how far before you lost sight? Um, also, they're usually, when they fly off, stay within one mile of their point of origin. Usually what most birds do when they take off from your house or wherever, is that they fly, they go up, and then they circle around <clears throat> to get kind of a overall aerial view of where they're at, and then land. So if you, um, if you think that the bird's like way gone, usually that's not the case, unless while they're getting the orientation part, a crow comes along and chases them, or a woodpecker comes along and chases them. If they get harried is when they go far, and where it gets a lot more difficult. So only the harried birds really take off far. Um, if you don't see the bird immediately, which most people will not, again, call. And then listen like that, call. And be really, really quiet without speaking, nothing. Because you're gonna wanna, when you call, you wanna hear any small sound. If you hear any small sound, oh, good parrot. I know where you are. Do you like to keep talking like that? And I try to encourage them to keep making sounds. In this case, Chloe, one time she flew off here at my house, landed in a bush. It was getting nightfall. Um, she would not make a sound. And I, I was like looking, looking, looking because it was nightfall. And so she finally made a tiny little sound from the bush. And there she was. And then I just picked her up and brought her back inside. So any small sound matters. So that's why listening really matters a lot, like super significantly. Um, that's why being as quiet as possible is best, minus when you make a call. So most parrots are located by sounds and or sounds that the, the environment is making. So trees, crows, whatever. So once a bird is located, so now you've, you're, hopefully your bird didn't go very far, like in this case, Chloe in the bush. Um, what I try to get uh, my friends, clients, people, everybody that I work with to do when they finally see a bird, a lot of times they're up in the 100 foot trees or higher. And so if it's a 100 foot tree situation or higher, I try to make sure like, okay, make sure that the owner and the bird can see each other really well and some kind of like I can actually look at their eyeballs. They can look at my eyeballs, no matter what angle we're at. We can eyeball each other. That's ideal where they can have eyes literally on each other. So if they can't, I try to position them to where there's an open space enough for them, them to get that. If it means a street over, I've done that too. And there's occasionally where I've had the moment of like, okay, I need to get on this person's roof of their house to get a clear shot. And uh, so getting knocking on the door, getting permissions for that has been rather crazy, but true. Um, so uh, basically the biggest thing is having that eye contact because it will keep the bird around because they'll look down all the time at you. They see that you're there. Um, they check in and make sure that you're there and you are. So their eye contact's really important and which way they're looking is too, because that will tell you where they're gonna fly next. Are they looking down? Are they looking this way? Are they looking this way? Are they looking that way? So everywhere they look, whichever direction they're looking will, and they take off, will then be the direction they go. This way, then they go. This way, then they go. So um, their, their eyes go first, their body follows. 
So um, if you see the bird respond to any kind of motivators, like if the owner says, oh, good bird, and the bird says, oh, or like some kind of sound, great. Um, it's like maybe a giant banana because the owner is not there. I've done bananas, I've done pizza, I've done bagels, and I'm eating it right in front of them. Yum, 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 yum. Um, and they've been out for a while not eating. So they're kind of looking at the bagel like, I think I might like that. Or I drink like crumpled chip bags. Um, they really seem to like chips because we like to feed our birds not so great things sometimes. Um, but if they want a chip, I'm going to give them a full on chip if they fly back to me, you bet because this bird doesn't even know me. It's a total stranger. So I've had that, or another one is taking a bowl of food. They normally have like you feed food, feed out your food in the kitchen every day. And it has like this ringing sound as you're pouring the food into a bowl. If it's a metal bowl and you use a metal bowl every day, use a metal bowl that you're ringing a sound in. Um, if it's a plastic bowl, bring the plastic bowl ringing the sound in. Um, I've even seen birds respond to water because they're really, really thirsty. So you drip the water sound and the water sound brings them down. I've had that happen. Um, but anything that they will actually look at and be engaged in to want to come to it is what you're looking for. And then does the bird call out when it hears it? So if I crumple the bag, right? Perfect. Good job. Um, and then, but the only thing is going to be a little bit careful if they start calling out too often, which happened with a Prionis parrot I was working with. Um, in his case, he wanted to call out to my, my Nande Conyer. So I used him, to, the Nande, to call to him to find out where he was. Found out where he was, but then he still kept calling. A sharp shinned hawk came in just as he was flying to me. The sharp shin came and went poop and picked him up. But luckily, since it was so low and so close to me by the time he got the bird, I went, wow! And so the, the hawk dropped the parrot and I recovered the parrot. I was lucky very lucky on that one because sharp shins are bird bird hunters um <clears throat> so and then the other thing is is that you look for typical behaviors to show pre-flight you know so winging is that pumping i think you guys know that one so are their feathers flat like <gasps> what is that i'm gonna take off um is if they are they're about to take off but if they're nice and calm and relaxed their feathers are puffed they're not going anywhere for a while so don't bother calling you know where they are you can see them they're puffed just hang out with them talk to them like hey i have some bagel here would you like some no 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 no, no? all right well i guess you're gonna wait um so look for the if they're preening if they're rubbing their beak on the branch that beak rubbing behavior is usually territorial marking is what most of that is and they also are scent marking to come back to that area too they do have scents at the corner, scent marks on the corners of their mouth. Did you guys know that? Dun, dun, dun. All right, so here we're back to Storm again. So we're kind of looking at his behavior right now. And if you look at that picture, does he look like he's puffed up, happy and comfortable? Doesn't look like it to me. He's like trying to look around like, how am I gonna get down from here? Um, he's slicked up. His feet or his feathers are high up. His body is high up over his feet. Um, he's just trying to figure out which way to go. And if he's got this nice opening this way, he sees. But we don't have in that same picture. Like what I would do is, since he's pointed the opposite direction where I am, yet he's looking where I am. That's gonna be a hard twist takeoff there from that position. So I'd rather do is use the hole that's in front of his head. I'd rather use that. I want to see if I can try to get. Uh, dun, 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 dun. back to him. My mouse to work would be awesome, but I don't think it will. It just won't. I just, one thing I don't like about Mac when I get into this is that it won't let me use my mouse. <laughs> but um, anyway, so there's a hole on the other side of his head there that's an opening in that tree. I would much rather have me position myself to where I can see his eyeballs in that hole and have him fly at me that way since his body's pointed that way. So right now, this is just discovery. There you are. Hi. He's like, yeah, I'm here, and I don't want to be here. I can tell. Let's get to a better place where you can come down to me in a better angle than coming backwards from yourself. That's not going to be an easy way to get him down. So um, there are a few behaviors that are common in parrots and when they're still up in trees. They do try to land. This is one trend I always see. They try to land where usually there's some tree, like some leaves overhead for protection, some kind of protection. And they like to land in an opening 
at the same time. So they can either take off from the opening and land in the opening, but they like overhead protection. Um, they go to the outermost part of a branch of a tree when they're about ready to fly. If they're not ready to fly, they stay tucked into the middle of the tree. Um, and they will tuck into a trunk at night, period. You know, it doesn't matter the size bird. They like to hide and be in protection of the trunk at night, as long as they have really good protection. And every single night when I know these guys are about to go to roost and they've decided not to fly, every single time they go to the trunk. Um, and then if they are about to fly every single time, they're about to go to the end of the branch and then take off. No matter the species, doesn't matter. Um, if they're calm near the trunk, it's okay maybe at that point. Now you know where your bird is at least. This is the scenario where you know where your bird is. So in this case, we know where Storm is here. We see him. He's there. He obviously wants to leave. In this case, instead of all of us leaving the, the position, I would have someone still out keeping an eye on him because he looks like he might fly because he's not trunked and he's in an opening and he's flat. So if anything, I'd have somebody come around to the other side to try to see if we can get it get a position where we can see him from the opening on the other side. If you're by yourself and he's comfortable and he's puffed and he's looking at the trunk, um, then yeah, I would leave for a moment. And if you if you don't have anything, your bird just flew off and you just found it all by yourself. Um, what I would then do, if your bird looks comfortable in the tree after you discovered it, you can leave for a moment and go inside to get your phone or whatever it is that you need or knock on a neighbor's house going, hey, I need your phone, can I borrow it? To call a friend to come out. Uh, that would be the time that you could do that if they're kind of to a trunk and puffed. So uh, one of my first fly-off cases that I'm going to discuss with you guys today, I've had many, I usually do about 20 or so a year, um, that we get involved with either, you know, physically climbing trees ourselves, uh, having cat canopy. We have a tree climbing service here that goes after cats, which is an amazing thing. We have really a lot of advantages to being in a wooded area and a lot of disadvantages because when parrots take off, it's woods everywhere and it's woods that are 300 feet tall. So, um, so it's pretty tall trees that we have to deal with. Um, so this is Pedro. Um, I actually want to write a children's book about him called Pedro the Wayward Macaw. But this is Pedro. He took off from a, a, play, a house. Um, he was not released from the house, but the person who owned him was like, oh, I didn't know he was gone. <laughs> Like, okay. Mm. Um, but so basically he he's what I would call the ownerless type of fly off. Um, where the owner is completely not involved, doesn't want to work on trying to get the bird back. So he's ownerless. Um, and he was out for over a week. Um, he was out and around an area of high indus industrial stuff and parks like lots, lots of, you know, mowed grassy park areas is over above a gas station at one point. And we kept coming back to try to get him to stay with us. We tried other birds to entice him. We tried a lot of different enticements to get him to come back. It's always harder, always, if the owner or the flock mate is not involved. If they're not involved, it's really hard, really hard to recover parrots. When they are involved, the recovery rate is well over 60%. It's really, really high when a person goes out right away and starts looking and being out there as much as possible. So the more you can be out, the more you can look, the better the recovery chance almost every time. So um, this guy, when we go out, I also count how many times is he flying? How far is he flying? I also map it out on a digital map when I'm out doing these things to see uh, like what's his trend, where is he going to go so we can possibly predict where he might be the next day. So this guy, his range was about 15 miles. He would fly five to six times a day. This took a lot of time to watch, obviously. And eventually he made himself into a neighborhood with short trees versus tall ones. That was a newer neighborhood. So he flew into a low tree and eventually a stranger that he didn't know had all this extra food in hand. And he came over for this big old nut and uh, she gave him the nut. He stepped up and then we recovered him. But that took, let's see, over, like we were looking for him and trying to get him down for four days where we're constantly monitoring where he is. And then we had a network of over 25 people tagging this bird, going to see him again. And like, okay, he's in this neighborhood today. Go check it out over here. Can you check it out at this time? I'll be there at this time. You be there at that time. And that's how we had to do it. And that's how we recovered him. So 
His first was these trees that you currently see him in, which is the 100 foot plus pine trees that he kept going in. And a lot of people ask, do these guys need water or food right away? Nope, because they have onboard food and water for a good three days, even in heat. So um, that's what that crop is for. So once that crop is completely empty, um, then yeah, these guys start having a problem. That's why there's a magic three day recovery. So by the third day is usually when they're really making strong attempts to come down or to find something or to find the food and water, preferably coming from an easy source than a hard source. So that's why there's that magic three day window. So if you get them back, usually by the third day, they're like, okay, I'm looking. I know I want to know where food is. I want to know where water is. I'm going to be looking big time. So can you guys see my green wing macaw in this picture? I can. <laughs> um, she is, oh, look, my mouse showed up finally. What do you know? She's right here. You see her now? I'm circling around her. Can you see my mouse? Okay, she's right there. Dee, dee, dee. That's a big, giant red bird. Do you see it? Yeah, see, so this is why I keep trying to tell people when you're out recovering a parrot, oh, that's big and red, you'd be able to see it just fine. I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> you cannot. <laughs> but this is Ollie. And that's Sunny, my eclectus. I'm on the roof of my, of my house. Say hi. Ollie, say hi. That's her there. She said hi. <laughs> so anything to get these guys to make a sound. Hey, Ollie. Can you say hello? Come here. Come here. Basically, I'm just trying to keep her engaged. She obviously can see me. I can see her. She is facing me. Sorry, my camera yeah. goes a little crazy there for a minute. Say, I thought she was here. From the sound is bouncing from this region, but she wasn't. She's above me up here. So you can see why it's difficult to get these guys back. I know. Oh, I we can see she's near the top of the tree. This is where macaws try to go. Is there always up at the top of the trees like that? Um, versus mid tree, that tends to be more like your African grays, Amazons and stuff that will land down lower in these trees. Macaws will usually land near the top. I think it's because they have the bigger wing size yeah. and bigger body size. So they want to be like as exposed as possible and see as much as possible, but also be covered. Where is clearly covered? Where Hi. did the birds usually land? You know, like cockatiels, conures. Yeah. No, do the, the small birds land lower in the trees? Yeah, the small birds yeah. land yeah. everywhere. Can There's nowhere the off limits. It's everywhere. We everywhere. Ground, top, mid, everywhere. They're, that's why they're kind of harder to recover because they're just, they literally can end up anywhere. So like, oh, he's here. No, here, 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 here. It's, it's crazy. Um, and obviously she eventually does um, come back to me, but she's Lord, like, no, I just come here instead. Which was fun. So here I am on the roof. Come on, Ollie, you're recall trained. And she's like, no, I want to stay in the tree. It's more fun. And I can see you anyway, so I know I'm safe. So I'm just going to stay. That's why you know that this bird is not a good, a good free flight candidate because she has, to, she has to do a lot of calculation to fly. She really, really likes the novelty of trees um, because she doesn't get a lot of exposure to them as much as I would like her to um, because I limit how much time she has outside. So she's not the best outdoor free flight candidate as a result. So... I really don't recommend um, bringing birds out there that have been clipped their first part of their life where they aren't flying with a bunch of flock birds. Flocking is way better to fly birds outside with. Individual flying outside, very dangerous. So be careful with that. So the big trick is the owner's involvement. Do you notice I would call or just try to engage like a regular, hi, I'm not like, Ollie, you know, I'm, I'm just like, hi, you wanna come here? Well, come on with the pauses in there for her to make noise. So the birds do respond to the person, the person the bird knows best or the bird the bird knows best. 
So if it's a if it's a bird member of the family, it responds to better. Use the bird member of the family in a carrier, backpack, whatever that's safe for that bird. But make sure that they fall out. Parrots usually take many days before deciding to fly down or fly down right away. Usually, like I said, it's that three day magic rule that finally they're like, okay, I've used most of my resources in my crop. I need to start looking for food and I need to start looking for water. And if I can't find it, I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, for some reason, the larger parrots, like I said, tend to land at the tree top, medium parrots at tree mid, and small parrots everywhere. Uh, they prefer to land in trees that do not hurt wings as they come in. So they wanna, they're always looking for holes that are big enough for their body to come in as they're flying. So their wings aren't hitting the branches. Um, so usually it's like an open space within the tree, but covered. So it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. All parrots tend to land in trees they can see into a bowl or a valley. I'll show you what that means in just a minute. But here's your tree. And then there's all these tree lines, right? And it makes basically like a bowl. So like, here's my house. I have trees way out here, 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 here. So you see, I was making a nice kind of bowl around my house of trees, but the whole house itself is open to land. So you're gonna see in a map here in a minute that my bird, you can see all the times that she's taken off and where she has landed. And it's perfectly in a bowl around my house. <laughs> Um, and the, almost every single bird I've seen fly off, even if it's a canary wing parakeet, which we've done as well, typically will land on the outside that opens to a bowl like, or a valley. Because I think the reason why is they can keep an eye on predators a lot easier. There's no trees in the way to block their vision of a predator approaching. Does that make sense? Yeah. Debbie, is there any preference for um, deciduous trees versus evergreens? I have noticed that here they land in firs a way more often than deciduous. Really? Huh. I, and I think it might be because the way the needles are, they bend and break, they bend easier to the wing when they land, maybe. Because mm -hmm. the big leaves might get in the way and they kind of slap them. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. But they do seem to have a preference for, for the fur over the deciduous here. I mean, I, you know, some places like Tennessee, I think, has way more deciduous trees than they do pine. So, <laughs> whereas we have a lot more pine than we do deciduous. So it might be a regional thing. I don't know. Um, let's see here. Um, bloop, bloop. Oh, yeah. And they tend to stay in suburbia is, versus going way out into the middle of farmland or something where there's not a lot of action going on. They tend to stay around where there's action, people moving, people doing things going on. It's really rare that they go out into a middle of the forest. Like I have not seen yet a pair really take off and go out to a middle of the forest from an urban setting. Now, if you take your parrot and you're a nasty owner, like we've had here in Washington, where they release parrots in a forest setting, then yeah, the parrots are in the forest setting and they're seeking a way out of it into a bowl setting or something like that too. So they have happened here where parrots were dropped off in the middle of forests. So, and yes, we get the call for those too. And yes, we try to go out and try to recover those, so. Um, the biggest thing is calling in others to watch out for possible flight paths. So that's another really important thing. So when I go out, I try to get at least three or four other people that can go out and we spread them out in a, like a different, like east, north, northeast, southwest kind of flying patterns. Like it, it's here in this tree, but it could go this way, this way, this way, or this way. And because it can, Let's spread you guys out in case it does fly off and goes your direction versus mine. We can keep better eyes on it. So this is that angle piece, that, what I call the angle of attempt. So to keep the flight pass as clear as possible and as flat as possible to reach the target as flying down is the last skill parrots develop because it's just not a typical skill that parrots do. They're not like peregrine falcons. They don't just... They tend to fly in a more, you know, linear sort of way. And that's, again, because of that heavy face. So if you can get it straight, like the position is with the first guy versus the second guy, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, you can also tell that the tree could be in the way with the second guy versus the tree not as much in the way for the first guy. So the first guy being the one right under the words angle of attempt, the second guy being next to the next, second paragraph here. So we, I try to discourage people from having too many people. I've, I've seen it a lot where people call in for help and there's like 22 people under the tree where the bird is and nobody is spread out. Um, and so when I get there, I'm like, hey guys, spread out. So that in case the bird flies, we can see where it's gonna go so we can 
help get guide them where it needs to go. The owner needs to be the main concentration or the animal, the what the bird that or the person that the bird is responding best to. So if the owner can't be present, at least it's got somebody present that the bird's responding to. So then that person becomes my target person that I want in the best position possible for that bird at the flattest position possible uh, to fly. So not down so much as an, a, a straighter path, at least, you know, maybe 30 degrees versus, you know, a, a 30 degree different, like that might be 30 degrees there. Yeah, at a 45, yeah, it's probably close to that. So I wouldn't go th this angle at all. I try to go more like the, 10% or less if you can grade, <laughs> but a lot of times that's impossible because they're in a hundred foot tree. Um, but this is um, one of the cases where I'm on someone's roof, yay. Um, and then this is actually how we re ended up recovering storm. So instead of the bird managing to fly down, he was in that same tree all three days that we went out, he would not leave the tree. So eventually opted to go ahead and climb for him. And my husband was the guy who climbed after him and put him in that blue bag that you see me holding. And then that's the owner of the house looking on to make sure everybody's safe. <laughs> so yes, I take great risk just for birds because it's worth it. <laughs> um, but uh, so we did end up, uh, you know, my husband basically just climbs no, he has absolutely no equipment when he climbs. He brings treats with him and then the bag that the animal's gonna be in and a rope. And he free climbs the tree and asks the bird to come to him. So it's still a small recall training. And then he treats it, he talks to it, he tells it all these lovely things as he's manipulating his fingers to its toes, grabs his toes and sacks them. So that's why we really don't wanna do those kinds of behaviors. We'd rather have them fly than sack them. Uh, so that's what I call that is sacking them or pillowcase. Um, but if you do have a bird fly off, have a pillowcase on hand does help um, as one of the main tools that are out there. So um, this is what I also call the possible flight path scenario. They can go up, you can go at any of these angles. Is he gonna go and see this person on the other side of the house? He's not. So the angles he's gonna approach, he's not gonna be able to find this person. So if he does take off, he's gonna take off and look for the person. So he's gonna go in every which direction to try to find the person instead of a targeted flight. You wanna much rather see a targeted flight versus where are you? And one time when my green wing flew off, I was at a wedding and she flew off um, in Illinois, mostly deciduous trees. And uh, she flew off above a dog kennel. And I got on top of the dog kennel to give her the easiest pathway. And I gave her, in this case, at that time, this was the cue I was using for her versus this. And so it went like this and asked her to come. She came. And then last minute, I went like that to grab her feet out of the air. She was right there, like literally right there. And I'm like, oh, and she's like, look at the <laughs> Went back to the trees. I'm like, oh man, that was stupid of me. Um, so she stayed up in the trees and then I'm watching and waiting for her to get settled and ready to come back down again. And she's looking like she wants to be settled, but then here comes two woodpeckers. And they went and attacked her. So off she went and I was like, oh, there she goes. And, and my friend down there who was having his wedding, I'm flying the bird for his wedding. He's the groom and he's like, is this normal? And I'm like, well, it happens. And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, it happens. And so sure enough, she flew off and uh, was harried by woodpeckers in this case. So, um, and then eventually I ended up getting her back. And I'll tell more about that story momentarily. But a part of that is making sure that I, I, she can see me. So at one point when she flew off that first time from the woodpecker, she went to a taller tree and I went into a field and I couldn't get onto the property where she was because it was a no trespassing property. And I guess it was guarded very heavily by the person who lived there with guns. So you are not trespassing on that person's property. So I had to go in a field across from the property, but I had a tree line and she could not see me over that tree line. And I could tell she was looking and she's calling, where are you? I can't see you. And I'm like, I'm here. You just got to fly and find me, but I'm here. And I try to make myself as obvious as possible on a truck bed in the middle of this cornfield. And sure enough, she flew off, was looking for me everywhere and couldn't find me. So she flew pretty far looking for me. Um, and then my calling kind of made her arc back towards me, but it still took a good couple of miles out of, out of my way. Um, so that was flight number two when she flew off that day. So make sure they can see you is what I point on that one. 
Um, and if there are many objects like wires and stuff and other trees that get in the way, that will also be a problem, like branches, like where they land, there's other branches out here that are in the way. It's gonna stop them from being able to take off that direction. They're gonna to wanna to avoid that branch. Um, a parrot will not fly, nor should a parent, parrot person ask a parrot to fly if there is an airplane or any aerial predator you can see. And there's a lot of times that like this bird, oh, he's very recall trained, 100%, 100% of the time, I'm like, yeah. You don't want 100%, 100% of the time recall training. The reason why not is because these guys see predators you don't see. And so if I call and I know they have really good recall normally and they're not coming, it's usually because something else is around there threatening them that I need to now wait, evaluate and see. What are you looking at? If you're not looking at me, you're looking at the sky right now. Why are you looking at the sky? There must be something there that I can't see. So I have to wait until you're ready. And then I can ask again. Does that make sense? So don't ask if there's an airplane, just don't. Uh, or any kind of aerial predator. Okay, so this is that uh, promised map of my macaw. Uh, this is my house and all the different times that she has flown off at different instances. Um, I think this is the same fly off date or time scale anyway. So the blue X's you see on the map are all the locations she landed, but then come to me. She's just checking out trees. So um, I'm 31425, that's me, the red, big, huge red thing. And she's landing in a tree that's facing me from the north. That's the one at the very top of the map. Then she came closer to me, but didn't land at me. That's the tree where I took the video, it was from there, that one. Um, she, before she landed in that one, she landed in the one across the street. So that's, the, that's a busy four lane street right there that she crossed, but then came back over into the neighborhood down off the very, very bottom south. But again, she's facing me. So you guys see how these trees are making a bowl? Can you see how the trees are like, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but from the X's, if you do like a circle around it, you can see how there's no really big trees in that circle. She's landing in, all the trees she's landing in are extremely tall, like 200 feet, and she's right at the top of them. So she can keep an eye on everything coming her way. And, and notably, she's not landing in the dense forest and the blue across the street there. She's not landing in any of those trees there. She's landing on the spots that have openings. You see that? This is the time uh, where we tried getting, we tried using every approach we could to get, uh, to draw in Pedro. So we got another blue and gold macaw, same species, uh, a live bird to try to get him to come back to. And he didn't, he responded a little bit, but he didn't really come back to that. Um, so we were out for hours, out for days, out with other birds, trying everything we could. So the main motivator, this is the list of like priority motivation and birds that fly off that I've seen and witnessed over the years. The number one motivator they will fly back to is the person in hand that they know best, number one. Or other parrots of the flock, number two. Or flock calls that you've recorded of the flock in your house or large food items like pizza, bagels, bananas, things like that, cellophane wrappers that make wrinkly noises, uh, water in a bowl has done it, and then shaking a favorite treat dispenser. Pretty much in that order is what I've seen uh, responses with. And then this is what I mean by dispersing the people who are helping you. Um, here's the bird, is, owner is in the best position. It could be, some of these people could be across the street. Like, like Ollie, when she flew across the street, it'd be nice to have somebody over across the street in that area, maybe near bushes. So maybe because it could be a small bird that's taking off. So you want people near bushes even. Um, so you want to make sure that they can still kind of see the bird and then, you know, stay on like a phone or a radio to say like, okay, he's coming your way. Take a look. Is he, did you see him? Oh yeah, yeah, I see him. He's over here. I'm like, all right. Yeah, I saw him come your way. So it's really, really nice to have, you know, the cell phones that we have nowadays where we can do things like that, whereas, you know, uh, it gets a lot more difficult. So Natural Encounters, they have 20 people on radios looking for the bird at all times. So they really have advanced teamwork. Me, I'm doing this by myself with no telemetry and just using my gut instincts. So this is a pretty tough way to find birds. And I do it pretty regularly. So this is the case of Freebird, the military macaw. And, and this is the person here who has absolutely no parrot experience. 
Freebird has been apparently, uh, we, I got the call saying there's this Mahal Luce in Everett, which is a hour drive north of me. And um, in this case, this bird, um, they're afraid of the 4th of July is scaring him. And it sounded like he's only been out for a short period of time when I got the call and I first started coming out there. No, it turned out he was out for over a month in the city of Everett and the neighbors were actually feeding the bird. So the bird was actually getting comfortable being around people, but not comfortable enough to actually walk on people's arms or come to people to come inside. So the bird was actually learning, oh, I can stay out, fly, get around and be fed. Well, I'll just stay out. Um, but he wasn't get, getting quite enough food regularly from enough people. Um, so, and then I thought with the whole 4th of July thing, I think I'm still going to pursue actual capture of the bird. He does look pretty thin. So um, this is free bird. And what I'm doing is I'm doing a training session to try to get him comfortable going to a person um, out in the wild, outside, where he could fly off anytime he wants and pretty much does. So this person has been feeding him off and on. For the past week. So um, so the bird was getting familiar with her and we're on a very rickety situation on this roof with this ladder she's standing on but she was willing to do it which is just absolutely insane and crazy. Here we go. So I want the bird to be comfortable sitting on her arm. Wait to give him treats so he's all the way on your arm both feet. Um, he's so it was what that's what I'm working on for the criterion. Both feet. There we go. Now give the treats. In this case, we're giving blueberries. And I was trying to do is keep him occupied so I could do a little bit of movement to try to get him used to just proximal movements. Um, so he did really, really good on that session. Stayed on arm while I did my movements. So arm doing is, was going great. Movement was doing great. Everything's going fantastically. She's checking to make sure she has enough in there. And the bird's not really, you know, too concerned. And then I moved again. And then he's like, ah, I don't know about that. I'm not too sure. And I'm like, okay, I moved a lot. I think I pushed this bird over threshold. You try seeing if you can get his attention. So that's what I'm telling her. So you see if you can get, draw him back to you and I won't move. Because this bird, any anything that looked like a capture or a try to capture or a sudden head movement in any way, he would just fly off. It, it, even the smallest amount of movement, he would fly off. There was not much you could do as far as any kind of movement. You had to make sure he came to you and it was very, 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 very calm. So what happened is that I moved when I shouldn't have because he wasn't occupied. So he never really came back to her arm again. He's still occupied with her. He still wants to hang out with her, but I'm not going to sit on her arm. He's, he refused from there forward just because of my movement to even sit on her arm. But he's still interested. He's intrigued. He's engaged. He's motivated, but just not too sure about me. She manages to get him around, get his back to face me again, which is what I'd rather have. Gets one foot on. Oh, he did. That's why, right. in this case, he did get on one more time. That's right. And then I moved again like a, like a silly person. That's what it was. It was the third movement I did. And then he's like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> and then he flew off right after that. As soon as I moved a little bit, he stepped off her and then flew away. All right. So as far as climbing goes, most tree companies, so if you have a tree company that actually cuts down trees, they are willing to climb trees. However, firefighters are not as, a lot of times they won't climb trees. They have, but they also know that the bird continues to fly off. That's why they really only go for cats versus birds. Um, but if you can convince a firefighter to help you, terrific. But usually um, it's pretty difficult to get them to do that. Um, now the tree climbers do usually have a price tag that's involved. To, you might need to pay for them to climb. And the other problem is a lot of tree climbers use equipment to climb which can share, scare the bird. Um, so you have to be, hopefully you get a tree climber that will be willing to listen to you as to when to start climbing, when to stop, when to keep going, one that will take treats up with them uh, to try to get the bird to come to them first before trying to bag them, uh, things like that. Because any kind of equipment, ropes, metal things, dangly things, clingy things, I've seen these guys fly off over and over and over again. 
Um, and then having someone observe the behavior as the climber climbs so they can cl call to the climber and say, hey, stop for just a minute, just wait. He's kind of nervous. He looks like he might fly. Wait till he calms down. Okay, now you can go. That kind of thing is way better than just him climbing and you saying nothing. And or if the bird knows you, hey, good boy, good girl, good bird for staying there while the person's climbing um, and hopefully keep them there. And then as usual, anytime you engage a climber, definitely set up that north, south, east, west perimeter thing I was talking about earlier. Always. So this one is a little bit more recent. This is 2022 that this uh, Scarlet Macaw flew off another disabled veteran that I was working with. Um, in this case, I ended up dig calling um, Cat Canopy Rescue. And this is how they approach when they're in the tree. Here's them. They're in the tree with the bird at bird level. We're just kind of taking our time with it, kind of giving her some snacks. So you can hear his voice. It's kind, kind of reassuring. Up. He's given her yeah. one treat already. Or is just eating. This is exactly how my husband approaches it, too. You ready to rock and roll? Huh? Yeah. All right. Back with Scarlett, the pretty girl. All and then we're down below. The yeah. owner's down below. The uh, bird can see the owner. This bird was just refusing flight. She was going nowhere. We tried for two and a half days to get her to fly down. She wouldn't. So that's when I called up Cat Canopy and said, okay, I think she's ready to come. Is everybody down there? See, and then you're gonna start seeing us and where we are there? down there <laughs> versus where he is. The pretty bird. Hey, Scarlet, the pretty bird. Yeah, I feel like a pirate right now. Arr. I got you, a pretty girl. I know, I got gotcha. you. So you can see that she's not too frantic in there. That's why uh, pillowcases are really okay. recognized. Because okay. it wraps it around the bird okay. and they actually okay. don't panic anywhere near as badly as, say, a carrier that you bring up to a tree. So I really recommend soft items versus um, versus hard items. And since he doesn't know the bird, he's going to keep it um, in the net. Let's go home, pretty bird. And uh, then he got to go home to dad. So that's how we recovered her. She did not want to fly. So then you have a scenario, you have no clue where your bird is. This is all scenarios where we can find the bird, we know where the bird is. The, then there's scenarios we have no clue, no clue where the bird is. So what do you do when the bird is nowhere to be found? Well, first you get out your cell phone, your treats, your water, and you still head out back. You don't know where it is, still head out anyway from your house and look for your bird, call to your bird and try to get them to come to you. Um, then you start doing the listening game to hear for unusual noises when you're walking around. And you want to stay out and walking around in that neighborhood, whether you know the bird is there or not. Just knock on doors, let people know my bird's missing. Uh, can you help look when you're gardening? You know, those kinds of things too. Um, nuts rattling cellophane. Uh, maybe bring out a fellow parrot uh, so the birds can call to you and begin a phone tree um, as you're walking around during the day. And maybe even at night, you start posting to social media or to a place like this. So when you can't find your bird, once it's nighttime, after the first day of flying, it flew off. I looked all day for it. I can't find it. I have no idea where it is. Come home at night, start getting on social media and let people know, hey, my bird's lost. So the best place, one of the best places to really post all that is the 911 parrot alert. There's other uh, 911 parrot alert type things on Facebook. They're back again with Carol running that. Um, and they do a great job trying to get birds notified as to both lost and found. So there's a lot of birds we find that we don't even know where the owner is. So um, this is a great one. They also have what to do to bring a bird back. Uh, so it's a great resource they have that's totally free. Um, this is the kind of posters I make. Um, and, and I suggest making the posters and stuff at night. And then if you still can't find the bird the next day, you're out walking again, listening again. Um, and then in this case, because the birds, when they first fly off, usually won't make noise. A lot of times they won't make noise for the first three days because they don't want to be discovered by a predator. That's why they're quiet. Um, it's not because they don't like you, nothing like that. It's just they don't want to be found because scary predator. So, um, so they're usually going to be quiet. So in the meantime, if you can't find them because they're really being quiet and you don't know where they are, that's when you can go back out again, start putting your posters out like this. And the other thing I tend to recommend, because I rain a lot here, is put these in a um, like an Office Depot plastic sleeve um, that you can pull in or out, but put it upside down so that the opening isn't getting water in it. <laughs> yeah, that way it stays dry. 
um, and then I tape the edge of it too. So that way you don't have to pay for expensive laminating. Don't do that. It's not worth it. Um, and then that way you can also reuse your sheet covers if you want to later on. But that's, I make my posters really, really bright and big. So that way people can see that. And then the next is who to contact, your friends, family, neighbors, as you walk around again, that door knocking thing makes a really big difference. Don't be afraid to knock on a door. Like even if you're looking like you're a Girl Scout cookie salesman, knock on that door. And people do respond, some don't. Uh, some get a little bit nervous about the door knocks, but usually when I knock on a door, maybe because I'm looking so insistent, I don't know, but I have really good response uh, when I knock on doors. Um, a great app to use is the Nextdoor app, which is the specific neighborhood you live in. So please post on your Nextdoor app because people are looking in that area and they're more specific and tailored to your specific town. And of course, Craigslist, um, but that kind of tends to hit like a more of a shotgun effect. <laughs> Um, but it's a good thing to post to too. But again, any posting you don't want to do during the day, you want to do it at night because your dedication during the day for those first three days should be you out looking and listening as much as humanly possible. And when you're out as long as humanly possible every single day, that's usually when we find them and usually get them back, even if you don't know where they are. Um, and then there is a website with Good Bird Inc. about how to get your bird back. And there's even a DVD by Robin and uh, Barbara um, about how to get your bird back as well. And my biggest thing is this, never, ever give up. Don't give up. I just saw a post on, I think it was 911 Parrots Third on Facebook, that they had the bird in a carrier. The bird was out 32 days. And they got the bird back 50 miles away. So it is possible that these things happen. Usually they're not that far away, but they are recoverable. Don't think that just because that parakeet flew off outside, it's not recoverable. Actually, interestingly, parakeets are also relatively easy to recover because they don't want to stay out. They want to go find somebody right away and they'll land on people. I don't know if you've seen that, but I've seen it all over Facebook. Oh, I found this parakeet. I found this parakeet. I found this parakeet. I found this parakeet. There's a lot of parakeets we find and that we don't know where the owner is. So don't think that your bird's dead just because it flies away. It's kind of interesting you mentioned about parakeets because we have a lot, we have a lot of lost parakeets in Connecticut. There are always postings about people seeing parakeets, but uh -huh. it's always difficult to get them. They don't want to come to people. Once they're out for a little bit of time, they usually come to bird feeders, but it's very, very difficult to catch them. And I, I only know one person who caught them by putting a cage and rigging a string and took a number of days, the bird would dart in the cage to get millet. And they finally got it in the cage and were able to pull the string to close the door. Wow, but, it actually was a cage recovery. You know how rare those are? Whew, super rare. But uh, there've been so many posts of people seeing budgies and nobody's ever able to catch them. I mean, once yeah. they're out two days, they're like, I'm cool with this, you know? Yeah. Oh, well, it depends. Like I had an Indian ringneck in a cornfield that was that way. He was like, nope, I'm feral. Leave me alone. Go away. Mm. I'm like, all right, there's nothing I can do. I'm like, guys, you're not going to catch it. Well, we'll catch No, no. He, he wants to be out. He's going to stay out. Yeah, especially since a lot of the budgies aren't that you see outside are probably not tame in the first place and probably yeah. to their owners. Um, yeah, those are hard to recall. I see that Bonnie has her hand raised. So um, this was um, wonderful. I hope to never use it. Sorry, Debbie. <laughs> um, um, I have a question for you. So Gabriel, um, Gabriel sings, if you're happy, you know it. Um, and, um, you know, we clap and stuff. And he responds to that and it's kind of like a flock call. But if God forbid he were to get out, I assume we wouldn't want him to do that because it could attract predators. Well, it depends. Like if he's going out right away and you want to know where he is and he's willing to respond, then sometimes, yes, right away, him making a noise is good as long as he's not making it too much. That's where it gets in trouble, like that Pionis parrot. Um, so, because um, me, yeah, I want him to call pretty much right away if I can. So I just have tabs of where they're at, at the very least. And then usually they then will get you know, want to come back sooner because you saw them and you responded to them and they're like, oh, you did respond to me. That means that you are listening and paying attention. Therefore, you, I will come to you even faster. So yes, I would say it'd be good that you actually have those things under on hand that he does respond to. Verbally. Okay. And then I have a second question. Um, the yeah. crows annoy him. Um, of course. 
and um, you know, they annoy all birds. <laughs> yeah, the, there's there's crows. I don't know if it's one crow. I wish I could tag them. Like, um, but one of my biggest concerns is there are crows that know he's here, and yeah. I think if he were to get out, the crow, you know, are smart enough to realize that he would be out. Yes, there's a possibility of that. Um, my guys are currently outside. They have outdoor aviaries and I have crows everywhere and they seem to not care about each other at all, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Um, they're just like, I'm here, you're there. That's nice. Oh, and sometimes I get treats from you. Oh, okay, cool. I would suggest be nice to the crows. Because Always be nice to the crows. Do not become their enemy. No, be no <laughs> I, I, I am not, I'm not mean to the crows, but I do when the crow can see Gabriel. I move Gabriel out be, of line sight because, frankly, I find it really freaky that the crow is looking at my cockatiel. It's, it's funny. My parrot, I noticed yesterday, there was a crow right outside the window eating a loquat. My parrot was in the windowsill walking and just right in front of it and was not freaked out at all. Yeah. Amazon. And yeah. I was and I've told my bird, we have to be nice to the crows because in another neighborhood, we got a bad reputation and they started dive bombing us and following us. Oh, yeah. Um, so if you ever I read said, uh, the work of John Marsloff, who is actually here at UW, um, yeah, all that facial recognition work in crows. Yes. But yes. <laughs> and I told, her, I told my bird, we have to be nice to the crows. They chase the hawks away. That's right. I feed, actually feed the crows come and get walnuts and stuff. Well, they, they oh. get my, they get the leftover pellets. I, cause I have them all on the aviary. Right. So sometimes I'll just chuck out some pellets to them. Like, Hey, good job guys. Thank you for leaving my birds alone. Yeah. But I couldn't <laughs> believe my bird wasn't freaked out at all. She was like right up to the window and like. There's, she a, was, there's a really good friend of mine here. Her name is Kathy. She actually worked in John Marsloff's lab. And so she had crows come to her house that she had to work with. Right. So her scarlet macaw was a baby and it learned to fly with the crows and mm -hmm. it talked crow and it knew crow. And so it would take off and be outside playing with crows all day long. <laughs> and the thing is, is that he would let himself loose by opening up the window and getting out. And then like, we're looking for him for like a month. Oh, where is he? Where is he? I don't know. So we think maybe somebody brought him in for a little while and then finally got tired of him being obnoxious like a crow. And so the person let him back out and we finally got him back and he just flew back to the apartment, opened up the window and came back in. I'm like, you learned a lot of good skills from crows, buddy. You know? <laughs> I mean, geez. Huh. It just, it just surprised me that she didn't react because I had another Amazon uh, 25 years ago, but he had been, I think a wild bird and he, he wanted to have the blinds kind of like semi shut so it could kind of hide out. He didn't want to be in the uh, open. Whereas she's like, she was like this far away, you know, this, about this far away from the, the crow wow. on the other side of the window. And she was fearless. But yeah, be nice to the crows so they be don't nice to the crows. Birds. Always. I, every day I just go out, hi, crow. How's it going? How's I do that. Hi, crow. <laughs> yeah, I have a large... Uh murder of crows in my yard but my cockatoo freaks out when they they come too close they can't see my birds because i have a coating on the windows so um but when she's when they come too close it's not as bad as if there's a hawk but if the crow lands one of the crows lands on the deck she'll she will scream and fly off so i yeah. actually was going to do that amy because i just heard that there's um, something you can put on the screen so they can see birds can see out, but crows can stuff not cannot see in. Yeah, it's there's a well, there are various things, but I use Kaleidoscape um, to keep the birds from smacking to the windows and dying. So all my windows and doors are coated with it, and it has the added benefit that you can't see in except at night if the lights are in the house. If you were to come right up to a window, you could you could see in, but uh, so it has the added benefit that people outside can't see in the house, which is nice. And uh, apparently it also helps keep keep the warmth in, but um, 
Um, it's nice also because I have some, like I have a hummingbird feeder on the window. I have another feeder that are attached to the window and I can get my face right up to them. The birds on the feeders can't see me, which is nice. So, uh, um, and I, it keeps the hawks from dive bombing the windows to try to get to my birds, which is also nice. My birds, however, can see the hawks, so they can get frightened and fly off. Um, and what you were saying, Debbie, you know, about the wing clipping. So one of my cockatiels, Tulip, I keep him clipped because anytime he sees a hawk or something, he flies off in a blind panic and he'll just smack into a wall, smack into a window, smack. And into they do that panic smack flight. That's, that's dangerous for them. No different right. than a human. So I keep him you know, at you. Clip you, know, like, whack, you know, it's dangerous for them. Yeah, it could kill him. So he stays clipped. So at least it slows him down when he flies off in a blind panic. And it's not something I could ever train out of him. It's just, it's totally instinct. But uh, I just, you know. I couldn't believe my bird was unnerved with his crow is 10 feet away. My guys don't care about the crows at all. Yeah. It's weird. I'm all trying right. to teach her to do the dove thing. I, I'm feeding three doves that live on my street. Oh, okay. They wait. Fun. They wait on the. They wait. They wait on the telephone line across the street, waiting for me to put the uh, the seat out in the morning. They just watch. See, I have that with the catbirds. I have a lot of catbirds, and I put out suet and mealworms several times a day in a little container for them, and they don't even care about me anymore. They just I yell. I walk outside, yell mealworms, and they just start dive bombing. <laughs> That's very impressive. Yeah, so well, unfortunately, I do have to get going to pick up a bird from the vet. So, okay. I hope that you guys have a good night. And thank, thank you, you Debbie. Thanks I'll so probably much. Probably you'll want to watch this again, De um, Amy, so I could make sure I have all everything down. Yeah, this, there Thanks, were lots Debbie. of great tips here. I mean, a lot of things about behavior. You know, I think most people know where to post and who to call, but I do worry about having, you know, I don't know, think I could pull together a whole group of people like that to just come and. and it, it's hard. It's not an well, easy thing to do. But I mean, we had our our vet um, our vet had her African gray fly away, and we walked the streets for days, uh, trying to find that bird. And we did see it looked it looked like it flew over the tennis courts into a tree, and and we stayed there. So she was back there before dawn we still never got the bird yeah we had a case of arrow the african gray african grays i think so far in all the recoveries i've done african grays are the hardest really um, i don't know if it's because they're popular so people keep them when they find them um i don't know but arrow the african gray had a five thousand dollar reward and we still didn't get him back wow. and um so we really think that he was taken by by predators unfortunately uh, what they, happened? they are the hardest they he just takes he took off from a balcony setting in an apartment and uh she was out right away we were all looking for months i mean we had spottings and sightings that were coming in from everywhere and we were looking 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 this is all during covid so um that was interesting um and nothing no, i made little name tags for people to wear around their neck so they looked official, so people wouldn't be freaked out if they see somebody walking by their property. Yeah. What and there's a couple times where I've got myself in trouble, where I walked on the property. I'm like, it's no big deal. This is public. And they're like, um, no, it's not. Get off. I'm getting my gun. And I'm like, okay, I'm out. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, so. What happened with that, mil that uh, military macaw? Were you able to recover it? Yeah, he's living with flying aviary, uh, flying colors aviary. Um, in that case, I had to lure him down with my blue and gold macaw. And so he was playing with her. And so uh, the two of them were like sitting on a, on a patio balcony thing. And so that he couldn't see me at all. And I was underneath him and I saw my bird's tail and his tail. And I went, wow, <laughs> and just crapped his feet. <laughs> That's he was not happy and I did not have a towel. And so, I mean, it was just like crunch, 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 crunch. You know, I'm like, ah, I deserve it. So 100%, you go for it, brother. I mean. Well, I'm glad you mentioned about having a call and then listening for something. Uh-huh. My Very bird, I can call and she won't do, a, she won't make a, uh, a noise. But there's, now that you, I think about it, there's a song that I sing that she will respond to. So now, I mean, if it, I mean, she can't fly, but if she ever did. It's, it's great to see these guys um, um, flock calling. 
it's really it's important so do it <laughs> like hey where are you at oh i'm over here so like when i heard the cockatiels making some noise there's these are new cockatiels i just got um that i'm fostering to try to find a place for them we'll see how it goes my husband's like why are you getting rid of them i'm like well i have you're the one who says i should have less birds you know anyway um they're cute and they hang out but i heard that they're like i had them out a little bit just when i got started and then i heard one of them do like the oh something's up whoa 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 and i was like okay we go check it out and sure enough he flew off the cage and didn't know how to get back on because he has a bad wing um so i had to go out there and a system and get it back in i'm like okay everybody back in let's go <laughs> you know but they called out so that's how i knew there was a problem that's good good yep well, we'll let you go well thank you again yep. Debbie. thank you debbie very good You're welcome. thank you guys have a good one never Bye. heard some of these things before this is great yay <laughs> yes all right have a good one guys Bye. wonderful thanks again everyone for coming